Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our online worship here with Drayton Reformed Church. We are glad that you are, wherever you are, tuning in uh, from our different homes, our different devices, that we can be together in some way uh, over distance through technology in this way. So uh, welcome to this, uh, this online worship service. We hope that it's a blessing to you and, uh, and that you feel the blessing of God through what we do here together. Um, this is a special Sunday in the life of the church and in the, in the calendar of the church. It's Palm Sunday. It's the Sunday that Jesus came riding into Jerusalem uh, to much fanfare, to praises of, of Hosanna and the waving of palm branches. And it, of course, is the beginning of, of a Holy Week, which leads up to next Sunday, which is Easter. So, um, of course, Palm Sunday is one of those Sundays that's always uh, a celebration in church. We have the kids coming down the aisle with the palm branches, and so it, it kind of, um, it feels like a huge loss to not be able to do that together in person, to have to, uh, to revert to, uh, to an online format for, uh, for this kind of worship service uh, is, is really unfortunate, and I think it, it feels like that much more of a, of a loss to be doing it on a, on a Sunday like this one. Um, but of course, these are the, the times that we're in, and, and we, we pray that you are in good health, that you're staying safe wherever you are, whatever you're up to. Um, just a note about this coming week, since it is Holy Week, we always have in our church a Good Friday service. Uh, so we'll be putting up a Good Friday service video, and part of our Good Friday service every year is sharing in communion. Now, doing our worship in an online format raises uh, 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 some logistical problems with how, how do we incorporate communion. So Pastor Duane and I have given this some thought, and uh, we really want to keep doing what has been the practice of this church, which is to incorporate communion with that service. So Pastor Duane and I will be here in the sanctuary uh, with the table that's usually up front, uh, keeping our social distance from one another, but, um, but doing the, the elements of, of the bread and the juice. If you're comfortable uh, doing this at home, we have a full faith that God will bless your participation in that with us. If you're uncomfortable with that, uh, that's perfectly fine. You can just watch and, and, uh, and, and not, be, uh, not be sharing in your own elements at home. But if you want to uh, prepare for that this coming Friday by getting some elements ready at home, it doesn't have to be a certain kind of juice, grape juice. We know that um, it, it's a physical sharing in what becomes for us a, a spiritual activity, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So if you want to get some bread ready, uh, some kind of juice or, or wine or, or whatever it is uh, that you have available to you, uh, you are more than welcome to be part of that with us. And um, we look forward to not having to do it this way again. We would much rather be sharing the cup and the bread here in our joint worship space. But we will be incorporating it in that kind of a format in uh, this coming Friday's worship video. Uh, with that being said, uh, I want to open our worship service with prayer before we join in some songs together. So would you please pray with me? God of all time, as we prepare to worship you today and this week, help us to call to mind these past events in Jesus' life so that we can sense their significance for our present lives and for the future you are preparing for all creation. In Jesus' name, amen. The next day, the great crowd that had gathered heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. This crowd praised him. They celebrated his miracles and with great expectation told everyone about him. But they did not know him. They were waiting for someone who would rule with strength and might, but he came as a humble servant. They wanted him to finally bring their people glory, but he wanted to change them so their lives would bring God glory. They were expecting a general who would crush their enemies, but he came saying, love your enemies. 
they thought he could offer them deliverance from their oppressors, but he came offering deliverance from sin. This crowd would soon realize that Jesus wasn't going to be what they wanted, and they turned on him before they ever realized he was what they needed. So as they yelled, Crucify! Pilate asked Jesus, Are you a king? Jesus answered, I am not that kind of king. His kingdom isn't what you see here. It won't be established by chaos and war. His kingdom is in our hearts. His kingdom is truth. His kingdom is goodness. His kingdom is righteousness. He is the humble king, the king of healing, the king of forgiveness, the king of love. Today, we lift our voices. We cry, Hosanna, save us. Save us from our sin. Come dwell in our hearts. Hosanna, we worship you. Jesus Christ, our king. Good morning and welcome to worship on the sixth Sunday of Lent. It's Palm Sunday. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the first Sunday of Lent, we introduced this song to sing throughout and we haven't sung it in a couple weeks. So let's sing it now, King of Kings.
24 says, Lift up your heads, O you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Lift up your heads to the coming King. Bow before God and adore him. Praise the King of kings. One of the things I love about celebrating Palm Sunday is the opening parade that the Sunday school kids do as they march down the center aisle, waving their palm branches above their heads. We always sing this song. Will you please sing it with me now? Perhaps you want to pretend to wave your branches above your heads as you walk around the couch in the room that you're sitting in. This part of the video is especially for the kids out there who are watching. So kids, I want you to tell your parents, your older siblings, well, they're kids too, you can keep them around, but kick all the grown-ups out of the room because this part of the video is for kids. I'll give you 10 seconds to get rid of the grown-ups while I find my spot here. Got my papers all out of order. Has that ever happened to you? Let me see here. All right, are the grown-ups gone? I'm just kidding. You can probably tell them to come back in the room. That's just fine. Well, today is what we call Palm Sunday. Can you say Palm Sunday? Look at your hand. This is what you call the palm of your hand. Wave your palm, wave at me. Thank you for waving. Do you think this is why it's called Palm Sunday? No, I don't think so either. It's Palm Sunday because on Palm Sunday, Jesus came to the city of Jerusalem, a city filled with people, and he came riding on a donkey, and the people got really excited, and they started waving. Do you know what they waved? Palm branches. Now, usually in our church, we have all the kids waving palm branches on Palm Sunday. You would be walking in here in the beginning of the service, waving them around. We don't have them this week, though. Maybe if you put your two hands sort of like this and kind of wave them like this, you can kind of simulate what a palm branch looks like with all the kind of leaves coming off the sides of it. And so they were waving these palm branches around and they were shouting, Hosanna, when Jesus came in on this donkey. And Hosanna means save us. So think about that. They're saying to Jesus, save us. Now, who's the only one who can save you, who can save a person? It's got to be a, a, a military leader, 
a king, uh, 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 somebody really, really important, right? So here comes Jesus on a donkey and they're saying, save us, save us, save us, Hosanna, Hosanna. And what they're really doing is they're proclaiming that Jesus is king, not only that he's king, but that he is the savior. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? That Jesus is savior and all the people are saying that he is the savior. But do you know what? On Palm Sunday, Jesus also cried. Why do you think Jesus cried on Palm Sunday? Do you have any ideas why? Was it because he didn't like crowds? Was it because he didn't like all the noise? Was it because he didn't like being around strangers? No, Jesus cried on Palm Sunday because he knew that the same people who were welcoming him that day, waving their palm branches and shouting, save us, Hosanna, those same people by the end of the week would be shouting, crucify him, crucify him, which means put him to death, let him die. Now, can you imagine that, the same people? I mean, just say, wherever you are, at your home, in your living room, watching this on a computer or an iPad, whatever you're watching on, say out loud, Hosanna. Hosanna! Now say, crucify him, let him die. Which one of those is better? Which one of those is nicer? See, when we say Hosanna, we are welcoming Jesus. We're inviting Jesus. And Jesus wept on Palm Sunday because he knew that the people who were welcoming him, who were inviting him, were some of the same people who would pretty soon be rejecting him. So we want to be people who welcome Jesus, not only on Palm Sunday, but every single day of our lives. And that's what Jesus invites us to do, to say, Hosanna, you are our Savior, save us, Welcome into my life, Jesus. Thank you for being my Savior. And we can say that through praying. And so let's do that now. Do you join me in prayer? I have a prayer here that I'll read. Jesus, we welcome you. We love you. You are the Lord of our lives, and we thank you that you are our Savior. Help us to welcome you today and every day. Amen. All right. Now, you received or your parents received an activity page that if they print it off for you, you can be working on that during this online worship service. If they didn't print it off for you, ask them to. And if they're able to, able to do that, if they have a printer that has ink and that has paper, which not everybody has, but if they're able to, then maybe you could either fill it out now or later. But make sure you ask about that because we're trying to send out some activity sheets for you to do at home. So we will see you again next time. Have a great day. Well, hello. And uh, we just want to welcome you again this morning to our worship service. And um, as we continue to worship together, I'm going to be uh, preaching on the sixth part of a seven-part series called Words of Life from the Cross. And we're going to be focusing on, um, again, that sixth word, the sixth utterance of Jesus, which he speaks from the cross towards the end, uh, towards his death, his, towards his last final breaths. But I'd like to invite you to, to pray with me, if you would, uh, as we open God's word and ask him to speak to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for Uh, you speaking to us through your Holy Spirit. We pray, God, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you would have us um, to learn, to to know about you, to be challenged by you. We pray, God, that you would um, just remove distractions and you'd help us just to focus on uh, this living word for which we thank you for. In Christ's name we pray, amen. 
So I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 19. And we're going to be reading um, from verses 28 to 30. Verses 28 to 30. You can turn um, in your hard copy Bibles, if you have one, or on your mobile devices. Um, John, chapter, John chapter 19, verses 28 to 30. And we're going to be reading again uh, one of the words of Christ from the cross. This is what John's account says and tells us. Later knowing that all was now completed... And so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had finished the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as we read the account of John, as well as the accounts of Mark, uh, Matthew, and Luke, uh, or sorry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, in that order, the hours have worn on. And, And we know that Jesus is in a state of exhaustion. The end is quickly drawing near. The darkness which shrouds the earth at noontime of that day continues, and in that thick darkness God's presence is hidden God has essentially turned his back on his son the crowd gathered has now considerably dwindled from what it was when the cruel act of driving the spikes into the hands and feet of the criminals took place that crowd is small that crowd is just a small group that's left it's eerily silent around the crosses save for the sounds of gasping for air being made by panicked and tortured lungs on those hanging on crosses jesus is hanging there and he looks like he's all but dead and in silence his beholders watch and wait for the ending of this horrible scene It's nearing a full six hours since the first nails were driven in his body. And Jesus raises his head. He looks to the Father, and in a gagging, choking voice of a crucifixion victim, screams, It is finished! If we look no further then to the words themselves, we might hear simply a very human cry of weakness and defeat. But oh, so much more is certain. Yes, Jesus' life was finished. Jesus, in effect, is saying it is accomplished, it is fulfilled, it has been achieved, but it is far from a cry of despair or defeat It is a cry of success. It is a cry of triumph, even in the moment of death. Jesus' race has been run, and he has endured to the end. The strife is over, and the battle is won. And Jesus' cry is a cry of relief, to be sure, but it is a cry of victory. The work I came to do is complete. It is finished for three years jesus had been doing the work his father had sent him to do and that work culminated in the cross and culminated with his death jesus says it is finished and according to matthew mark and luke we don't get this in john uh, the sense of john but he just didn't say these words he shouted it It is finished. We've all started things we didn't finish. I I have, certainly. You can see it in a partly mowed lawn, the half-read book, 
You can see it in the unfinished letter, the unfinished home renovation, the partly finished photo album. But praise God for what Jesus starts, he finishes. And he says it is finished, and it's perhaps one of the greatest words that Jesus ever speaks. And why we no longer have to sweat the debt of sin. You see, when Jesus said it is finished, there's at least three things that is very significant about these words. We know, first of all, that the pain of suffering was finished. From the time Jesus was born, Jesus lived in the shadow of the cross. Every time he went to the temple and saw those animal sacrifices, he was reminded that he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And his life was filled with suffering. There was social suffering of being rejected by his own family and his own nation. There, there was the physical suffering of crucifixion, perhaps the cruelest form of punishment in the history of the world. And then there was the spiritual suffering of bearing the world's sins, of being totally separated by his heavenly father. We know Jesus suffered, but we will never know we will never know how much he suffered. And so the pain of suffering was finished. But also the payment of sin was finished. Have you ever wondered whether or not our country is in debt? Well, all you have to do is just go to the website called debtclock.ca, which is run by an organization called taxpayer.com, debtclock.ca. And there we, you will see, by their calculations, that our federal debt is increasing $1,000 every second. When I looked at it this past uh, Friday, April 3rd, the debt stood at over $713 billion. $713 billion, which works out to approximately about $19,000 per person. Now that's a, a money debt clock. But there's another debt clock. There's a, there's a spiritual debt clock that began to run in the Garden of Eden. More accurately, I would call it a sin debt clock. A sin debt which is owned fully by the human race. Every person born with a sin debt to a holy God. The Bible says that we were, in fact, born spiritually and morally bankrupt. Now, let's talk a little bit about that sin debt. First, God never writes off a bad debt. He never does. Because a holy God demands a full payment. And secondly, we just can't declare bankruptcy with, with the hope to begin over. No, God expects the debt to be paid in full, but the problem is we don't have the payment God requires. And so we thank him for sending his son, Jesus Christ. That's where Jesus comes in. Jesus comes into this world to pay a debt he didn't know, in order that we might be relieved of a debt we could not pay. It is finished. Now the word Jesus used, it's just one Greek word, is tetelestai. Tetelestai. So what does this word really mean? Well, back in the time of the Roman government, the Roman law said that when a man was brought before a judge for a crime, the judge could adjudicate this man as either guilty or innocent. Now, if the man was guilty, then the judge would prescribe the sentence and would write out a piece of paper called a certificate of debt. And on one side of the piece of paper would be the crime that the man had committed on one side of the paper. But on the other side, you flip it around, was the penalty 
that the crime incurred. So if that man was put into prison, this certificate of debt would be nailed to his prison door. And anybody who wanted to come by could read it. They could see what this man had done and what he was having to do to pay for his crime. Now, when this man had paid to the uttermost, that is, he had paid his penalty for what he had done, and when someone had come and paid his fine, or when he had paid it, or when somebody had come to pay his fine, they would then come and write on that particular certificate of debt this word, tetelestai. They would write that word, tetelestai, meaning paid in full. They would then take the certificate off the door, roll up the certificate, and give it to the prisoner. This was his proof that the full demands of the law had been met. He had suffered, he had paid in full, and he was never again to be brought into the judge or to the judge and be tried for that crime again. And so that is the word that Jesus used on the cross when he said, it is finished. Literally, he said, it is paid. It is paid in full. Jesus said, it is finished. That meant that the last drop of blood had been shed. The final price had been paid. The cup of God's wrath had been drained completely dry. And that debt of sin has been canceled. The walls of sin had been completely torn down. The gates of heaven had been permanently opened and you no longer have to sweat the sin debt for Jesus paid it all. It is finished. So the pain of suffering was finished for Jesus. The payment for sin was finished. And finally, the plan of salvation was finished. Back to that word, that Greek word, tetelestai. It, it was also a very common word in, in the time of Jesus. It, it was used by servants. When a master would order his servant to do something, the servant would go do that duty and do that work and come back and say, tetelestai, it is finished. That word was also used by artists. When an artist was painting a portrait and he touched the canvas for the last time, applied the last drop of paint with the last stroke of the brush, he would step back and say, tetelestai, it is finished. In John chapter 4, verse 34, Jesus said this, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And Jesus had a work to do. A work that had been given to him in the eons of eternity before the creation of the world. So why did Jesus come into the world? Why was he born a babe in Bethlehem? Why did God become a man? Well, John tells us, or John tells us in 1 John 3 verses 5, he says, you know that he appeared to take away our sins. Now, in the Old Testament tabernacle, there was a lot of furniture, but there wasn't any chair. There was no chair in that tabernacle because the priest could never sit down. The priest could never sit down because his work was never finished. There was no chair to sit down. He could never sit down. Always, always on the job. But praise God, we have, we have a high priest of whom the Bible says in Hebrews 10 verse 12, after he had offer, offered one sacrifice, one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. Not only did Jesus fulfill the word of God, he finished the work of God. 
And that's why he could say in, in John chapter 17, verse 4, I have glorified you, Father, on the earth. I have finished the work for, you, for which you have sent me to do. Jesus had been made sin for people. And he had suffered the penalty of God's justice, which sin deserved. The price had been paid. And when Jesus says it is finished, not I am finished, he was saying that his mission was completed. And the scriptures tell us in Hebrews 12, verses 2, that Jesus kept the goal of his life's mission always before him. And through all the struggle, through all the dark, cross-shrouded moments Jesus went through, he kept that goal of his life's mission always before him because Hebrews tells us in chapter 12, verse 2, that Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, the joy, the joy that was before him, the joy was set before him. The, the joy of being able to remove the humanly immovable obstacle of sin's guilt. The, the joy of opening the way of prodigal sons and daughters to be restored to their Heavenly Father. After he says these words on the cross, I can picture him hanging there, waiting to know when to die. And the Gospel of Luke records the visual, Amen, response given by the Heavenly Father. For we read that the curtain in the temple separating the holy section from the ordinary, that curtain is ripped from top to bottom. It is torn by an unseen hand. And it throws open to the gaze of everyone a place once filled with the presence of God, a place where God had manifested his glory, a place where only the high priest ever went in once a year. And now, the Holy of Holies is no longer sacred. For God has now opened up a new and living way for his people to access him. No longer is there any need for any high priest to enter the most holy of holies. For the greatest sacrifice that could ever be offered up has occurred. For Jesus said it is finished. And God, God the Father accepts Jesus' work as complete. It is finished. I want to encourage you to perhaps look at those words of John. John chapter 19, or, or look at the corresponding passages in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I want you to read those words. Don't go quickly through those words, but let your eyes set upon those words, it is finished. It is a moment to pause. Hang on to the moment. D don't, don't quickly push it aside as something done in, in, of yesterday. Don't be in too big of a rush to sweep aside the heaviness and race past Good Friday to Easter Sunday. There is victory. There is victory. In those words, it is finished. My prayer is that in this time of, of being physically distant, all the measures that are being placed, put in place, and, and there's already a sense that when is this going to be done? It may be for some time yet. May you throw yourself upon the mercy of God. Would you bring that which is, that which is weighing you down and, and allow him to take that upon you? Christ took the weight of the world upon him. And he invites you to do that as well. Perhaps you have never given your life to Jesus Christ. And you continue to work and you continue to push yourself and continue to be better and, and try to do, be good, be a good person. But it'll never be enough. For the debt that we owe, only Christ 
can pay. Give your lives to Jesus Christ and find peace and hope and trust in him. He is the savior of the world. He can be your savior as well. I invite you to pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that though uh, your son was on the cross dying, he still spoke words of power and significance and life. We thank you that you came to finish the work that we could never possibly even try to complete. Thank you for taking on the sin debt. Thank you for paying it in full. And thank you for finishing the work that you were called to do. Lord, help us to rest our lives in you and in that truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. At this point in our worship, we'll be joining together for our congregational prayer. 
So would you please join me in prayer? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of David, you entered Jerusalem with a triumphal procession that left you alone and in humiliation on the cross by the end of that week. Jesus, we thank and praise you for your selfless sacrifice. By it, you conquered the powers of sin and death and set free the children of God in all times and places. We praise you that you were obedient to death, even death on a cross, that the redemptive will and power of God would be unleashed into your world for your glory. We thank and praise you for the redemption of creation, even now, we know that creation groans with longing for the full redemption that will come at the end of time. Bodies groan with age and disease. Rivers and skylines groan with smog and pollution. Communities groan with violence or hate speech. Lord, we long for the full healing and renewal of creation. We praise you that you promise no less than this, and even more than we can imagine when you bring into the fullness a new heaven and a new earth. We praise and thank you for those who offer their lives in Christ-like service around the world. We think of missionaries, especially those that our church family supports. We think also of medical personnel of all kinds, whose self-sacrifice is now on display as hospitals and medical professionals seek to treat a pandemic and to stem its spread. We praise and thank you for your work as it continues in our community. We pray that you open our eyes to where we can be neighbors who exhibit and tell of the love of Christ to others, neighbors who share the hope we have in you with those we know, and who act in love and in service for the good of those around us. Lord, give us compassion and grace to put your love on display. We praise and thank you for our redemption, that you sealed in your death on the cross and your resurrection on Easter morning, which we look forward to celebrating next Sunday. Lord, the cries of Hosanna soon turn to cries of crucify him. Today, too, there are those who refuse to recognize you as king. The effects of sin continue to be felt in all of life. And so we pray. We pray for creation. We pray for the nations of the world. We pray for our nation and its leaders. We pray for this community and for those who serve in leadership. We pray for the church around the world as it works on your behalf. Lord, we pray for this local church and its members. We think especially of those who are sick, who are receiving special medical care or treatment. We pray for healing. We pray for the right care to be made available through this time of crisis caused by a pandemic. We pray for those who are elderly or immunocompromised and so especially susceptible to the dangerous and even deadly effects of COVID-19. We pray for those who are lonely, fearful, and anxious. Lord, as we seek to weather this storm, we pray for a special measure of your grace, your protection, and your strength. We pray this for all the people in our church family and our community with particular needs. Many of these needs, Lord, are deepened at this time. We pray that you encourage us to open our eyes to those around us and seek out how we can better love, support, and encourage. God, we pray for society's leaders at this time to steer communities towards guidelines and regulations that lead us through this pandemic in the best way possible. We pray for treatment and for preventions in the near future. God, we pray for resilience and for strength. Lord, with the angels and all creation, we look forward to the day when we will join in declaring Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. 
Friends, as you go from here into your week, go with the hope that only our Lord can give you. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen.